verse 11 of chapter 4, the writer says, Let us therefore labor to, to enter into the rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. I read that last verse because of the end of a section. And then verse 12 to verse 13 transitions into the new section. But when we were looking at the section last time, we saw that Jesus, first of all, is greater than the prophets. Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus now is greater, we're going to see, than Aaron and the Iranian priesthood of the Old Covenant. But he was warning them in the section we just finished, coming to the end of chapter 4, verse 11, he was warning them not to, not to be in unbelief and not enter into the blessings of the promises of God. And he used an illustration of the children of Israel at Kadesh Barnea, how they failed to enter into the promised land. So they were, they were not being obedient to God and to His Word. That's why it transitions into the power of the Word and how the Word can work in our life to strengthen us in our walk with the Lord. So the end of the section was verse 11, chapter 4. We should therefore labor to enter into rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. They did not enter into the promised land, but unbelief kept them from entering in. So he's warning these Jews who are in danger of leaving Christ and going back to Judaism that through unbelief they would not enter into the life of blessing and abundance with Christ. Now, verse 12 and 13 are a well-known verse where he speaks about the power and the effectiveness and the qualities of the Word of God. He says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner, we get our word critique there, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature, verse 13, that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him of whom we have to do. Now he just, at the end of verse 11, he mentions that they fell because of unbelief. Then he immediately begins to speak about the word of God and its power and its qualities to ground us in our relationship with God. You cannot grow you cannot enter into the blessings of Christ. You can't enter into the blessings of fellowship with the Lord unless you're properly related to the Word of God. This Sunday, we're going to start our new series called Great Doctrines of the Bible. And again, I'm overwhelmed with the vastness of the subject and the challenge is what to not cover, what to leave out, and how many weeks to spend on each subject. I'm trying to do it one subject a week. But our first subject is going to be what the Bible teaches about the Bible, about the Word of God. Because that is our foundation for all truth and doctrine. All the doctrine we have about God, about the Christian life, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about salvation. All of it comes to us from God's revelation in the Word of God. So when I do a kind of a systematic theology, kind of a sermon message, you might say, is what it's going to be. I want to start with the foundation of our faith, and that is God's Word. Then we're going to move to God, and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and salvation, and on down the line. But I was really intrigued by this passage as I looked at it this week. The Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. So I want to just point out, I'm not going to get bogged down because we covered it a bit a couple of weeks ago, and our text is supposed to start at verse 14. But I couldn't resist going back over some points about this marvelous passage. There are actually four qualities about the Bible I want you to see in this passage. The first is that the Bible is a living book. It is also called the Word of God, verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful. Notice the word quick there in the King James Bible. The word quick means alive. Now, in the Old English, they figured that if you were dead, you weren't very quick. That's actually how they came up with this concept. So it's an Old English word. If you are alive, you want to move, you want to be quick. So they use the word quick. But it's saying the Bible is the Word of God. The Scripture tells us all Scripture is given by 
inspiration, 2 Timothy 3.16, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scriptures God breathed, all Old Testament scripture and New Testament scriptures breathed out by God. Peter said, holy men of God spoke as they were carried along or borne along by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk Sunday morning about inspiration. We're going to talk about revelation, inspiration. And we're going to talk about clarity and sufficiency and how to interpret Scripture and its importance in our life. and What the Bible says about itself as it's found in the Word of God. So it's called here the Word of God. And its first quality is that it is living. Why? Because it's the Word of the living God. Amen? It's the Word of the living God. So He's a truth God, true God. His Word is true. He's a holy God. It's His holy Word. But I love that concept that it's, just, it's the Word of the living God. And it's interesting that God's Word can make dead sinners alive. We're going to see in just a moment that it's the sword of the Spirit. It's like the sword, the double-edged sword, the Word of God. A literal sword pierces men who are alive and kills them. The spiritual sword, the Word of God, pierces men's hearts who are dead and gives them life. So it's a living Word and it brings life to sinners. I was reading about Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, how he was studying the book of Romans. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God broke onto his heart and opened his eyes to the truth that the just shall live by faith and that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ. And the Word of God, the Spirit of God working in his heart brought, back, brought about salvation and brought about the reformation and the transformation of the entire world and especially us in the Western world by that one individual as the Word of God started that fire in his heart and in his life. And even as you go back further to John Wycliffe and William Tyndale and John Huss, it was the Word of God that was alive and powerful and transforming their lives, bringing them to salvation and bringing about a change in their lives and in their culture around them. Then also, the quality of this Bible, this book we call the Bible, is that it's a powerful book. Secondly, notice verse 12, and powerful. God's Word is quick, it's alive, and it's powerful. The word powerful means it's energetic or it works. It's working. We actually get our word energetic from this word powerful. And so the word is alive and it's powerful and that it works in our hearts and works in our lives to transform us. Jesus actually said in his high priestly prayer in John 17, he said, Father, sanctify them, that is his people, through your truth, thy word is truth. So we learn in that statement that God's word is true and that it's transforming of our lives, that we are sanctified by the word of God. So we're saved by God's word and then we're sanctified by God's word. You might say we're also equipped for service through the word of God as well. So it's powerful. And then third quality, notice it in verse 12, is that it's sharp or that it's a two-edged sword. Now the sword is described here sharper than any two-edged sword. The word sword, there's different Greek words that's used for sword in the Bible. The word sword here, as we would call a large knife. It was a large dagger. It was the same sword that Peter grabbed and tried to cut off the ear of one of the servants of the high priest in the Garden of Gethsemane when they came to arrest Jesus. And it's interesting that that sword Peter used in the flesh trying to defend Jesus, but then on the day of Pentecost, he stood up and preached the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and 3,000 souls were saved through the preaching of God's powerful Word. But it's like a two-edged sword, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's interesting that it pierced even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and is of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner, is a critique of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, it's a challenge to understand what is implied or meant by the spirit and the soul, because even good Bible theologians 
aren't sure whether man is a trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit, or a dichotomy to these body, soul, and spirit being one, that there's only two parts to us, and that soul and spirit are, are, are the same. They're synonymous for one another. But either way, it's saying that the Word of God reaches deep down into the heart of a man, and it actually reveals his thoughts and the purpose and motive and intentions of his own thoughts. Notice it says a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the hearts. So God knows what you think. Matter of fact, he knows what you think before you think it. And then he also knows why you think what you think. I don't know why I think what I think. I don't know what my motive is or why those thoughts come to my mind. Have you ever had a thought come to your mind and you're thinking, that is so bizarre. So we think crazy thoughts. We don't know why we think them, but God knows the thoughts of our hearts. He knows the motives of our own hearts. And that's why when you read the Word of God, which is alive and powerful and sharp, it cuts deep, deep down into your very heart and your conscience. Now when it's talking about the heart here, it's not talking about the physical organ. It's talking about your inner person. This is again why he calls it the soul and the spirit. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. So you read the Bible and it convicts you. I heard of one Christian from China that said, every time I read the Bible, it kicks me. I love that. You ever read the Psalms and God just jumped off the pages and spoke to your heart? Or you read a verse and it just jumped into your heart or jumped into your mind or grabbed a hold of your heart and you knew it was just what you needed for that time? And the fact that God's Word is living and transcends time and culture. Think about when the Bible was written so long ago. And yet it's so alive and powerful because it's the living, active, powerful Word of God. This is why if we're going to go on in our walk with the Lord, not fall or come short or in unbelief miss the blessings of the Lord, we're going to have to meditate our minds and our hearts in the Word of God and be transformed by this book. So it's also a sharp book. It's used to convert sinners. It's used to build up the sanctify the saints. And it was used by Jesus. He used the sword of the Spirit. Remember when he was being tempted by the devil, Satan, in the wilderness? And all of the three temptations that Satan brought against the, the Lord, how did he answer him? It is what? Written. So Jesus used the Scriptures to defeat the devil. So the living, powerful Word of God is used to save sinners, to sanctify the saints, and to resist the devil. God has given us His Word, and if we hide His Word in our hearts, the Bible says we will not sin against Him. We use that to answer all the temptations that the Lord, or that we deal with. And then it's a penetrating book. We sometimes forget verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in His sight. It's basically saying that God knows our hearts, knows us intimately. Remember Psalm 139? Search me, O God. Know my thoughts. Try me, O God. And see my wicked ways. See if there any, is any unrighteousness in me and lead me in the path of, of righteousness. So He is... We are open and naked by the Word of God revealing to us our sin. And it says, and to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. So the Bible exposes our sin and our thoughts and the intents of our heart. And it also enables us to live holy, godly lives. Now we come to verse 14. And verse 14 starts a very long section. And I don't want to get bogged down in outlining it again. But it goes from chapter 4, verse 14, to chapter 10, verse 18. This is the main body of the book of Hebrews. And we're going to be introduced to that mysterious man of the Old Testament called Melchizedek. We won't get into him in depth until we get to chapter 7, but we'll be introduced to him tonight in this text. But basically, we have the priesthood of Christ, that Christ is better than Aaron and the Levitical system of the old tabernacle, or the Old Covenant. So in verses 14 to 16, we have that He is a better 
priest, follow with me. Seeing then, so he comes back to his theme, that we have a great high priest. Now, not just in Christ a high priest, but notice the word great. He's the great high priest that is passed into the heavens. And literally, that would be translated passed through the heavens. There are basically three things described as heaven in the Bible. There's the atmosphere above the earth where the birds fly, that's the heaven. There's the outer space, the stars, moon, and sun, which is the heavens above. And then there's the dwelling place of God, which is called the third heaven by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So when Jesus ascended, and that's what it's describing here, he passed through the heavens, and then he went to his heavenly abode and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he ever lives to make intercession for us as our great high priest. So he's passed through the heavens. Then it describes him as Jesus, the Son of God. And this is what we're supposed to do. Hold fast. Let us hold fast our profession. Not our salvation. That's not in jeopardy. But our profession or our testimony. For, verse 15, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Notice again the, the clear reference to Jesus being impeccable. He was without sin because he could not sin. He was a pure, holy son of God. So here's the second command. Let us therefore come. So if you do mark or highlight your Bible, in verse 14, let us hold fast our profession. And then in verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now again, one of the reasons why I wanted to slow down just a little bit tonight because we come to this marvelous, marvelous passage, not only on the Word of God being alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, which by the way is why at this church we're committed to reading the Bible committed to preaching the Bible and teaching the Bible in every facet of our ministry here at Revival Christian Fellowship, that we are a Bible church and that's central because we believe the Bible is the Word of God. It brings us salvation, sanctification, and equips us for service. But we also have a great high priest. Now, go back with me to verse 14. Why is this subject introduced And many times we as Christians would think, why would we come out on Wednesday night when it's freezing cold and it had been snowing? You know, we had to tromp through the snow to get here, right? You probably had to chain up your car to get here. Isn't that that crazy? The people in Minnesota would laugh at us. People were dancing out in the snow, which lasted five minutes before it evaporated. But why would we study about this priesthood of the Old Covenant now as we are Christians of the New Covenant? Well, let me tell you why he brought it up in the text. These were Jewish Christians who were beginning to question whether or not they should continue to follow Jesus Christ. And they were being persecuted for following Christ And they thought it would be easier if they just went back to Judaism and the old system. So the writer of Hebrews is trying to encourage them not to go back, but to go forward. And he does that by showing them that Christ is better than the old covenant, that it's a better priest than that of the Aaron's priesthood of Levi. So that's why he was talking to them. Now, They would think, uh, I'm a Christian, I'm following Jesus, but I don't have a priest any longer. How do I come directly to God? They may not understand that Jesus Christ is actually our high priest and gives us access to God the Father. And that Jesus being Messiah, which they understood, was from the tribe of Judah, which was the Messianic tribe. But the priesthood was from the tribe of Levi, So in their minds, they're thinking, I'm getting shortchanged here. This isn't good. I don't have a priest anymore. I don't have anyone to mediate before 
God for me. So I think I'm going to give up Christ and I'm going to go back to Judaism. So he's warning them that don't, not to do that. And he's warning them that Christ is superior to that of that of Aaron. So he says, we have a great high priest that is passed into the heaven. So they don't have to be discouraged. They don't have to be disappointed. They don't have to think that they're getting shortchanged. Now there are some today who come to know Christ and are born again and have a personal relationship with Christ out of Roman Catholicism. Now, anytime I mention Roman Catholicism, somebody gets upset with me. So don't, don't, don't shoot the messenger tonight. Just listen to me. In Roman Catholicism, they have a priesthood. They go to confessional. They go to Mass. They celebrate the Eucharist. And they feel like they have a tangible individual, a human, that is a mediator for them or an access to get to God and that they can't go directly to God, they can't talk to God themselves, that they need to have an earthly priest. First of all, in the New Testament, there are nothing about being priest in the sense of a pastor or an elder or a bishop or an overseer. In none of the passages are they referred to as priests. All Christians are referred to as priests and that we actually can come into the throne of grace and we can intercede for others and we can represent God to them and we can represent them to God in prayer. So the Bible actually teaches the individual priesthood of all Christians that we have access to God. But it also teaches that Jesus Christ, even though he is the sacrifice for our sins, that he is our high priest seated at the right hand of God the Father and that he actually goes within the veil for us and takes then his sacrifice to the Father and that he is the mediator between God and man. So if you feel like you're shortchanged becoming a Christian or even a Protestant Christian, you have Jesus Christ who can take you directly into the presence of Christ, access through him, through his blood. You don't need to go through a man, a priest, a pastor, an intermediary. You can come directly to God through Jesus Christ. And you don't need to use the saints either. Notice we have a great high priest. And that phrase says, we have. That's a present possession. We have Christ who, and it will not change, who is always and forever our great high priest. And then this passing into the heavens or through the heavens speaks of his ascension when he went from earth to heaven bodily. So he's exalted at the right hand of God the Father. So many times we stop with the incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and we don't think about the ascension. And then we may stop there and we don't think about the exaltation. We stop there. So Jesus is not only risen from the dead, he's ascended back to heaven and he's exalted at the place of honor, the right hand of God the Father. And he's alive right now to give you access to the throne of grace. Amen? No, no need to go through a priest or wait once a year for a high priest. But we can go right directly to God. How marvelous that is. Now, he's superior because of his position, verse 14, because he's at the right hand of God the Father. And he's also superior because of his person. He is also the Son of God. Now, when he says Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, which is Jehovah saves, or Joshua of the New Testament, or the, of, of the Old Testament, Jehovah saves, is his human name. But it conveys that he's the Savior. But when it says he's the Son of God, speaks of his divine nature. So Jesus, the Son of God, indicates his dual nature. This is why Jesus is our high priest. He is both man and God. I know you hear me say that a lot, but it's so important to understand that. He's both fully God and fully man. Some say better to say truly God, truly man. Sinless man, but full, genuine, authentic manhood, his humanity. So he's Jesus, 
the Son of God. Never a Son of God, but the Son of God speaks of his deity. Now, notice it says that in light of that, we need to hold fast our profession. So he's trying to encourage them not to go back, not to let go, not to give up, not to slack. He's not saying you're going to lose your salvation. He says you're going to lose your testimony. You're going to lose your profession. This is a confession or declaration of your following Christ. You're going to ruin your testimony. So it's interesting that he doesn't say there, don't go back or give up, or you're going to lose your salvation. He didn't say that. He said you're going to lose your profession. You know, I believe that once we're saved, that we're kept by the power of God unto the day of redemption. I believe that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit and that no one can break that seal. Do you know every Christian is sealed by the Spirit? We don't hear that talked about a lot. We're indwelt by the Spirit and we're sealed with the Spirit until the day of redemption and no one can break that seal. And nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. So it's not holding fast your salvation, which some people think that's what you're doing. And uh, that's a frightening thought to me. That my salvation is dependent on me holding on to God. You know, one of the things I love about being a grandfather again, you know, you get to have kids over again a second time. If I knew how much fun they were, I would have had them first. But I've always just, I always just, I get so excited when they put their little hands in your hand. And you can walk them across the street or walk them through a shopping mall. And they just, they just feel their little hands grabbing a hold of you or grabbing onto you. And, you know, when there's danger around and you have a little one with you, what do you do? You hold them tighter. You bring them closer. I'm so glad that Jesus is holding me. It's not a matter of me trying to hold on to him. And the book of Judas is unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the throne of grace with exceeding joy. I love that. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, it says that we're kept by the power of God until the day of salvation. I was reading Jerry Vines, which is an old Southern Baptist preacher on this text, and he likened our being kept by the power of God into salvation to Noah and the ark. And I thought it was pretty cool. He said, when Noah built the ark, and his whole family went on the ark and God shut the door and the rains came down and the floods came up and the ark was floating in the water. Noah didn't put nails in the side of the ark and tell them to hang on. And that if you don't hang on, you're going to get thrown overboard and you'll be lost. No, God brought them safely into the ark. God shut the door of the ark and God protected them through the storm in that ark. That ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. He is our ark of safety, our ark of protection. And when you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. You're safe in the storms of life. And it's not you hanging on to Him, but Him hanging on to you. Now, should we hold fast our profession? Yes, we shouldn't go back. We don't want to lose our testimony and we don't want to lose fellowship with Christ. We don't want to dishonor Him or bring shame to His name. But we're not trying to keep ourselves saved we're saved by grace, we're kept by grace, and we're going to go to heaven by the grace of God. That should be a motivation to holiness and godliness and worshiping and thanking Him, not seeking to be a sinful Christian. On the contrary, we should be seeking to live holy lives. Now, notice he says four. So here's the rationale. Why should we hold fast our profession of faith? For we have a, not a high priest which cannot be touched, with feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. So whenever you find a four so many times in the beginning of a verse, it many times indicates the, the rational or the, the ration or the outflow or the reason for the verse that went before it. So why should we hold fast? Because we have a priest which can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Now, he puts, him in, he puts him in the negative. He says he cannot be touched with feelings of our infirmities, but he's trying to convey the idea that he can sympathize. The word there, touched, 
Literally, we get our word sympathy from that. So it speaks about the fact that because he was a man and became our high priest through the incarnation, that he can sympathize with us. He can be touched with feelings of our infirmities. And that he was tempted in all points like we are, but he did not sin. Now, this is a marvelous, marvelous truth that can go unnoticed in the passage. But it's basically saying that because of the incarnation, and listen to me very carefully, in the incarnation, deity and humanity were fused together for all eternity. That means Jesus right now is the exalted God-man in heaven. He's in that glorified human body in heaven. He is the prototype of our future resurrection. How marvelous that is. Jesus actually goes before us. And because of that, God in heaven understands your weakness. Jesus understands your sorrows. Jesus understands your disappointments. Jesus understands your struggles. If not, we wouldn't be able to understand how could God know what I'm going through. He's never been a human. He's never been a person. How could God living out in the cosmos of heaven, how could He understand my hardships, my difficulties, my weaknesses? He left heaven, was born on earth, and lived a sinless life, and was tempted in every way we are, yet he didn't yield to the temptation. Now, when he was tempted, his temptation was authentic and genuine, but it didn't come from a sinful nature like it does for us. But it's very possible that these temptations, all points like we are, refer to the three categories that Satan tempts us, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? He said, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. You're hungry, aren't you? Turn them into bread. Lust of the flesh. Same thing that he did in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. It's good for food. Eat the fruit. Then he took him to a high mountain. Showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. They're mine. I can give them to whoever I wish. If you fall down and worship me, they're all yours. This is why you came to redeem the world. I'll give it to you. Lust to the eyes. Then he took him to the pinnacle of the temple, says, throw yourself off. Got really, got really subtle and tempted him by using Scripture himself. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you and bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus actually then answering again with the Word of God says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve the pride of life. I'm not going to bow down and worship you. So all points was Jesus tempted. Now the fact that He was tempted and never sinned means that He maxed out the temptation. By that what I mean, when Satan tempts you, if you yield to the temptation the minute he starts to tempt you, then you don't know the intensity of the temptation. Those who resist temptation know the intensity of temptation. Someone said, I can resist anything but temptation. It's like boxing. I heard the analogy. If you got in the ring with a world... Uh, number one world heavyweight fighter. And you were knocked out in the first seconds, which is what it would happen to me. I didn't have to take much of punishment, right? Just one big blow and I'm down. But if you got in with a heavyweight fighter and you went all 15 rounds, you stood the whole match, you'd know the full wrath of that fighter. So Jesus actually experienced the full power of that temptation because he never surrendered and he never yielded. And the reason now is that he is able to help us when we are tempted. So he's able to sympathize with us 
and he's able to energize us and help us in our moment of temptation. When we cry out to the Lord, I'm being tempted, he understands. He sympathizes and he also energizes and helps us to resist that temptation. So he says we have a high priest. He's sympathizing with us. He's all points tempted like we are, but he did not sin. So that's his perfection. So verse 14 is his position. Verse 15 is his perfection. And then verse 16 is his provision. So here's the second command. Let us therefore come. So let us hold fast our profession. Then let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, let us therefore come boldly. That word come means drawing near. So because Jesus is our great high priest, because he's sympathetic, and we're going to learn in chapter 15, or not 15, but chapter 5, that every high priest had to be taken from among men so he could be sympathetic and compassionate toward men. That's why Christ had to become a man. But we find here that we come boldly or draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Now, notice that come boldly. That word boldly means to have confidence of speech. It doesn't say we come cocky. It doesn't say we come ordering God. This word faith, positive confession concept that we tell God what to do, we order God around, is blasphemous. We come humbly, but we come with confidence. So what it's talking about is bold face speech. It's talking about the fact that you can open up your heart and bear your heart to God in honesty and humility and brokenness in any time. That's what it means to come into the throne of grace. Now notice it's a throne of grace. So we come with confident speech. We come to a throne that's a throne of grace. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by who? Jesus Christ. So we have a throne, not of wrath or judgment, but it's a throne of grace. Isn't that great? God's undeserved, unmerited favor. And then notice that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in what? A time of need. I love that. Now, if you're like me, I need God's grace and God's mercy. When I was in Florida last week, we were preaching there with a group of pastors. I was out there, and uh, Pastor David Guzik was preaching on the mercy of God. And it just overwhelmed me. It was one of the best sermons I've ever heard on the mercy of God. And he was talking about many facets of mercy, but he was saying we're only recipients of mercy because we're sinners. And we deserve wrath. Mercy is undeserved favor. It's something that God doesn't give us what we deserve. So when we say, God, be merciful to me, we have to come with the concept of me a sinner. Remember the story that Jesus gave about the two, the Pharisee and the publican that went to the temple to pray? One stood and prayed with himself, God, I thank you, I'm not like other men. Fast twice a week. Give tithes of all that I possessed. And then Jesus said, another man came and beat upon his breast and just said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus asked, which of those two went home justified? Obviously the man who said, be merciful to me, a sinner. So mercy presupposes that we are sinners in need of, Uh, in need of mercy because we are due the judgment, the wrath, the penalty of our sin. So we pray for mercy. God, be merciful to me. And it's such an awesome thought that so many people, when they came to Jesus and prayed for healings, they actually said, have mercy on me, thou son of David. Have mercy on me. I love the story of blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Sat on the highway side begging, and he cried out, Jesus, 
Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And it caught the Lord's attention. He stopped. He said, call that blind man. Now before Jesus stopped, they probably said, shh, be quiet. He's not got time for you. Silence, blind man. And he says he screamed all the louder, have mercy on me. And it caught the ear of Jesus. Aren't you glad he's merciful? And you know what it means to be merciful? It means that he has tender mercies. It's tied in with the same concept of being compassionate or caring for you. So when God shows mercy to you in your plight and in your misery, it's because he loves you and he's compassionate and he's kind. But it presupposes that we are due judgment and we're in need of mercy. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. And we, we make such a big deal out of grace, and rightfully so, but we should also magnify the mercy of God. If it weren't for God's mercy, we would all be in hell right now. And He would be perfectly righteous and just in doing that. So don't you ever get the idea that you deserve anything from God. God's merciful, gracious, slow to anger. And God's mercies, the Bible says, are new every morning. Amen? So I love the fact that the throne of grace that's accessible to me is a throne of mercy because I need mercy. I'm a sinner. And I find grace to help in time of need. That is God's appointed time. David prayed after his great sin with Bathsheba. In Psalm 51, he said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out all my transgressions. Wash me and make me clean. As he cried out in Psalm 51 for the mercy of God. How important to see yourself as a sinner in need of God's mercy and God's help. And that time of need means God's appointed time. So very simple, but very simply profound. And I'm going to stop right here. Don't, don't freak out. I'm not going to go into chapter 5. We'll stop right here. Because I want to end on this note of God's mercy. We all need God's mercy. We all need God's grace. And if you have believed in Jesus and trusted Him and been born again, you're a child of God, you can come anytime 24-7 into the throne of grace and find mercy and grace to help you in your hour of need. Whatever your need, need is tonight, tell it to Jesus. Get alone with Jesus. Pour out your heart to Jesus. Cast your cares upon Jesus. He cares for you. When your soul is in distress, think about His faithfulness. Let's pray.